It may have been the greatest army of all time, conquering and controlling an empire that stretched across the ancient Western world. It was ruthless, disciplined, and feared by all, not just by its enemies, who died in their millions, but by its own emperors, who often paid the price of the army's wrath. And yet, these soldiers were builders as well as destroyers, helping to spread a culture that became the bedrock of Western civilization. What was it that made this army so dominant? How was it able to rule and reshape the classical world? And why did it eventually fall? This is the story of the Roman war machine. refused Roman demands to surrender their town or city. Weapons like these may have been among the last sights they witnessed on Earth. Siege warfare was one of Rome's greatest tools for winning and keeping control of its empire. The Roman siege weapons, adapted from the Greeks, gave them a tremendous versatility for conquest. This catapult for flinging heavy stones was called the ballista, are really designed to batter away at either bodies of men or particularly gateways, stone walls. It would take a long time to knock down a decently built stone wall, but you can lob the balls over the walls and hit the defenders who are hiding behind. Now, the machine gets its power from twisted skeins of rope, which in ancient times were made of sinew or horsehair, and through each skein of rope goes an arm. So it's already under tension, and as they wind it back, the arms are put under increased tension. And we're using here a ball which is about the size of an orange, and this is found archaeologically very common. But the biggest ammunition from these machines comes from Israel, and that's in the form of stone balls weighing 100 weight. And to shoot that, the machine would be about 40 feet high. A different type of machine was the catapulta, built like a crossbow that fired heavy arrows and bolts with deadly accuracy. designed to shoot arrows, but an arrow far bigger than you could shoot with a handheld bow. And it's an arrow like this. It's heavy. It's got a large square-shaped tip, which would penetrate armor, penetrate shields, penetrate men. We know that when battering rams and siege towers were used, machines like this were positioned in them to give that covering fire as the machine moved towards the walls. And in field battles as well, these were very useful. The Romans had other siege weapons, too. They used high timber towers on wheels, manned by archers to pick off enemy defenders. Other movable structures, like tin sheds, were used to protect soldiers operating heavy battering rams. When attacking fortified towns, Roman soldiers often used the tortoise formation, locking their shields to protect themselves against the hail of enemy fire that would rain down from the walls. With all these weapons and tactics, there was almost no town or city in the ancient world capable of resisting the Romans. And those who tried were inviting slaughter and destruction. Perhaps the two most famous Roman sieges both happened in what is now Israel. Judea, as it was known then, was conquered around the time of Jesus' birth. But the native Jews bitterly resented the Romans, whom they regarded as heathen. And when the Roman governor demanded money from the Jewish temple, open revolt broke out in 66 AD. After three years of fighting, the Romans finally surrounded the main Jewish stronghold of Jerusalem. It took the Romans another four months to break through the three city walls protecting the temple. The catapults hurled huge stones at the defenders. These large, dazzling white limestone blocks 
hurled in by the Romans to the city. And the besiegers had their own slang. When they saw one of these white stones coming, they would shout, here comes a baby. And they'd all lie down in the hope that it would go across them and land safely. The Romans, becoming aware of this, actually blackened the white stone so that they wouldn't be so visible. Once the Romans broke through, they ran amok, killing thousands of citizens and selling the rest into slavery. Jewish holy relics were carried off to Rome to be berated in triumph, and the temple was destroyed. If uh, cities and communities in conquered areas quickly surrendered and came to terms with the Romans, they were generally pretty well treated. And in fact, their ruling classes were often um, given the Roman citizenship, sometimes very, very quickly, and could become quickly integrated into the, the Roman world. But people who continued to resist could expect very little mercy from uh, the Roman state or the Roman army. And there were some cases where Roman behavior amounted virtually to genocide. The Romans later allowed the Jews to return to the temple site to mourn over the one remaining wall, hence the term Wailing Wall and a tradition that continues today. Although the Jewish rebel cause was now hopeless, one band of zealots continued to hold out. They took over a fortress perched on a plateau, rising 1,300 feet above the Dead Sea Plain, south of Jerusalem. The fortress, called Masada, had been built 100 years before by King Herod in case of attack by the Egyptians. It seemed unassailable, and the 960 zealots dared the Romans to try. Masada is symbolic. It's important for the Romans because the elimination of this last resistance stands as a symbol that nothing will stand in front of the Roman Empire. There was no prospect of starving the place out anytime soon because Herod and his uh, successors had put huge stores of food there was plenty of water because Herod had constructed huge uh, rain-fed cisterns inside the mountain that were, that were fed during the winter rains. The only way to take Masada was by direct assault. The 10th Roman Legion, which had led the assault on Jerusalem, arrived at the foot of Masada in late 72 AD. The Roman force, with its auxiliaries and forced Jewish labor, totaled about 10,000. It began by building a wall, whose remains are still visible, that was six feet high and three miles long around the entire plateau, to let the rebels know there was no chance of escape. Unlike the rebels who were well housed and supplied, the Romans were camped in a merciless desert, scorching by day and freezing at night. Supplies for their camps had to be brought in from the Jerusalem area, 16 tons of food a day and 5,000 gallons of water, about 400 donkey loads each day. But then, logistics were among the Romans' greatest skills. It's incredibly important, as was seen in the Gulf War, where millions of tons of equipment had to be moved in just so that the army could do its job. And the Romans were acutely aware of this, and their logistical organization was, was really very good for the period, considering their limited technology. And of course, that is one of the main reasons they built all those roads, was to keep the army capable of moving and to keep it fed and supplied. Without these logistical skills, the Roman Empire couldn't have been maintained. Now the question for the 10th Legion was, how could it assault the summit? From nearly every angle, the 1,300-foot cliffs were just too steep. But there was one possibility on the western side, where the height was only 250 feet, with a rocky outcrop that gave the chance of building a ramp for the siege equipment. The Romans and their laborers began building the ramp, protected by movable sheds, and were given covering fire by archers and catapults. The Jewish defenders probably used slingshots in self-defense. This pile of slinging stones has been found on the site. Eventually, the Romans came to within 50 yards of the summit fortress. Just how long it took to build the ramp has been a subject of debate. The popular view is that the siege of Masada lasted for two or three years. I don't think there's any reason to uh, think that the siege lasted more than four to eight weeks. Uh, most Roman sieges uh, were fairly short. Siege of Jerusalem 
one of the most hardest fought of ancient times, took four months. Once the ramp was finished, the Romans used their battering ram to break through the outer wall. But that wasn't enough, because the defenders had built a second wall behind it, made of wood and earth that the battering ram could not budge. The Romans responded by setting fire to the Jewish wall. And this seemed to work initially, but at one moment, the fire blew back and looked like it might burn all the Roman siege engines. But as Flavius Josephus, who recorded this, said, God was on the Roman side, and the fire blew in and burnt down the Jewish wall. The Romans waited for the next morning to make their assault. And inside, the rebels knew that their capture would mean a terrible fate. In most cases, uh, rebels uh, were enslaved, but they also might have been killed, uh, even uh, crucified, or uh, sent to fight in gladiatorial games. So the rebels decided their own fate. They drew lots to determine who would kill the women and children, and then each other. When the Romans burst in at daybreak, they were met only with silence. Then they were approached by two women and five children who'd hidden and escaped the mass suicide. And they told the Romans what had happened. It's to the Romans' credit that they were amazed that this had happened, that they felt even in their victory there was an element of defeat. Masada marked the end of the Jewish revolt. But it flared again 60 years later when the Romans decided to build a settlement on the ruins of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Jewish rebels fought the legions for four years, leaving many thousands of Jews dead. Many of the survivors were forced to leave Judea, hastening the Jewish dispersion. By the year 100 AD, the Roman Empire had been expanding for some four centuries. And under the Emperor Trajan, himself a general, the expansion continued. He annexed Dacia in modern Romania, plus Arabia and Armenia, and drove deep into present-day Iraq, reaching the Persian Gulf in 116 AD. But these new conquests stretched the Roman army to capacity. When Trajan died in 117 AD, he left another general, Hadrian, as his successor. But Hadrian quickly reversed the expansion policy, pulling out of Iraq and fixing the empire's borders. He had seen the human cost of that and how difficult it was for the Romans to expand any further into lands which were apparently more capable of resisting them. Hadrian did not just draw lines on a map. He had very visible boundaries built on the frontiers. In Germany, it was a nine-foot wooden palisade, now partly reconstructed on site, which ran for 350 miles between the Rhine River and the Danube as a control line against German tribes. Even more emphatically, he ordered the building of Hadrian's Wall, running about 80 miles from sea to sea across northern England. It was 15 feet high, and dotted with forts that together housed about 10,000 soldiers. Time has weathered it down, but partial reconstructions show how astonishing it must have looked to British tribes. The ancient writers say only that it was built to separate the Romans from the barbarians, and archeological evidence at one fort near the wall, Vindolanda, shows there were battles in the region not long before the wall was built. Romans had a lot of casualties with commanding officers being killed, that's very unusual. And of course, that, to a certain extent, gives a reason for, for building the wall. A lot of trouble, Hadrian puts it down, we'll make damn certain it doesn't happen again, build the wall. The soldiers themselves built the wall by hand. Three legions, about 15,000 men, took nearly 10 years, and it was finished about 130 AD. But there were more than just defensive reasons for building it. Many believe Hadrian was making a statement to his own generals, who enjoyed the Roman tradition of conquest and booty. Under Augustus, Virgil writes his poem saying, uh, you know, the gods have given Rome an empire without end, an empire without end in time or space. 
And this, this Hadrian says to him, we're not going to have big wars of conquest. We're not going to keep on extending the empire. This is it. This is the end. The wall, with its many gateways, also served as an economic barrier for collecting taxes on trade and preventing weapons dealing between local tribes. And Hadrian, a general himself, who'd spent much of his life in the army, would have been conscious of keeping the legions busy so they had less time to hatch political plots. There's nothing more dangerous, I would have thought, than a highly trained killer with nothing to do. I mean, what, what is your soldier? He's a highly trained killer paid by the state. And if you don't give him anything to do, you're asking for trouble. The wall might also be a monument to Hadrian's ego. He loved building on a grand scale and considered himself an expert on architecture. He personally helped to redesign the Pantheon in Rome. And Hadrian's own villa, just outside Rome, was so huge that it took a 1,000 soldiers just to guard the perimeter. It covered 300 acres, twice the size of the city of Pompeii. While Hadrian's wall and other defensive barriers were strong symbols of the limits of the empire, they were not strict borderlines. The Roman army still controlled areas well beyond the physical frontiers. The Romans would patrol long distances beyond those frontiers and also had networks of spies and intelligence agents. They would expect to know of any possible threat to those frontier lines well in advance and could actually nip it in the bud. At Vindolanda, excavations have revealed a letter written by a Roman officer out on patrol, well beyond the official frontier. And he actually writes into our commanding officer saying that they've done their job. Um, should the men be dispersed back to their units or does he, should they all be brought back to Vindolanda? But the real point of his letter has got nothing to do with that. The real point of his letter is that the men have run out of their beer supplies. He's asked for more. They haven't come, why not? Another way the Romans patrolled their many borders was with their navy. The remains of these Roman ships were found buried in the muddy banks of Germany's Rhine River in 1981 by construction workers laying the foundations for a hotel. Based on what was found and referring to Roman artworks, experts have built life-size replicas of Roman navy ships at the Naval Museum in Mainz in Germany. The Romans largely used oared warships, galleys, and uh, these were crewed actually not by slaves, as Ben-Hur has, uh, has suggested, but actually by free sailors and marines. So a typical warship was actually quite small in the imperial period, maybe with a crew of not much more than 50, with its own individual officers and, of course, a, a, a captain. And a vessel like that would largely be used for uh, maritime patrolling, keeping an eye on, on, uh, on, on possible piracy and, and practices like that. The ship recreated here was 65 feet long, powered by 32 oarsmen, and sails when the wind was right, and was capable of going 12 miles an hour. It carried extra soldiers apart from the rowers and was used to patrol trouble spots along the Rhine. Rome had naval bases throughout the empire, using the ships mainly for troop transport and protecting trade. For much of the empire's history, the Romans did not need to fight great sea battles, because after Rome conquered Carthage and Egypt, there were no other sea powers left. When the Emperor Hadrian decided to fix the borders of the Roman Empire, he helped change the nature of the Roman army itself. Instead of making new conquests, many soldiers now had fixed addresses on the frontiers as defenders rather than attackers. The forts reflect the change with a gradual shift from timber forts to stone forts. This is what a stone fort looked like in its day. This is the fort at Salzburg in Germany, rebuilt on the foundations of the original. Roman forts were usually sited at strategic points, like a mountain pass or a river crossing. They were rectangular, enclosing an area of up to 50 acres, and had defensive towers every 50 to 60 yards to launch missiles against the attackers. There were also deep ditches around them to repel enemy raids. 
The fort's central building, the Principia, was the administration center with offices set around a courtyard. But most of the fort was taken up with barrack blocks in which the common soldier got to know his fellow legionaries more closely than he would have liked. This is one of many barrack rooms in the fort here at, uh, at Chester's on Hadrian's Wall. And in this particular space, eight soldiers would have spent their leisure hours, and this is where they would have slept. This whole area here would have been divided off by some kind of partition around about here. The room out at the front was probably where they kept all their equipment. So it was in an area like this that all of these soldiers actually had to eat and sleep. And in fact, they may have not have been on their own. It's quite possible that uh, also some of them at least will have had their wives and children in here. This was a very crowded place. Living arrangements were much more civilized for the career officers, the centurions. In comparison to the spaces lived in by ordinary soldiers, a centurion had a whole house to himself. This large rectangle of foundations here, the remains of one such centurion's house here at Chester's, and you can see there are a number of rooms. He had a separate living room, kitchen, storage facilities, bedroom. There was plenty of space for him and his, his family, his wife, his servants, all to live in together. And this actually reflects in stone the great difference in social standing between an ordinary soldier in one of these barrack rooms and a centurion. Centurions were paid at least 20 times as much as ordinary soldiers and had living accommodation appropriate to their standing. For the commanding officer, the living quarters were almost like a country villa, reflecting his position as a nobleman. The example unearthed at Vindolanda Fort on Hadrian's Wall came with central heating. The hot air, which is the furnace must be next door, in comes the hot air, circulates around the pillars, and then it comes up through the walls. Now, in here, we know there's a wall vent. There's another one here. And the hot air is drawn up through the walls and then out through the top. It's actually a very efficient heating system for a house. Uh, with one proviso, you do need half a dozen slaves to keep, <laughs> to keep the boilers going. Because of the strict social order in Roman life, the commander did not socialize with the enlisted men. We've got the remains of the social diary of the, uh, our commander, Flavius Cerealis, covering a period of two and a half years. And uh, in that course of that time, he, he is giving quite a lot of dinner parties. Uh, dinner parties for the governor of Britain when he comes here, dinner parties for fellow commanding officers, and once rather nicely, a dinner party for his veterans, the, the soldiers who just recently retired. But there's no hint of all other ranks coming in and, and eating at the commander's table. The commander, unlike the common soldiers, was officially allowed to have his whole family live with him in the fort, and there is wonderful evidence of that. Here are the shoes of his wife, and it's so rare for us to be able to say that that little slipper belongs to Sulpicia Lepidina, wife of Flavius Cerealis. She has a very distinctive shoe size. Look at all these little indentations here. The shoe is stamped with the name of the maker, uh, Lucius I. Butius Thales, uh, and a sort of maple leaf stamped on it as well. And all, we've got several of her shoes, all the same little size. They have their three children with them there. And here's the little one's little boot. Now, that is a very expensive little boot. That's all hand-carved out of a single piece of leather. And he's even got his little studs in the bottom. And you can see how he's been going over on his heel, sort of dragging his typical small boy, I would think. Roman forts on the frontiers were like self-contained Roman towns. Almost every fort had a bathhouse, like this one, excavated at Chester's on Hadrian's Wall. Romans were fanatical about bathing and hygiene, and their baths were an elaborate process. The soldiers also used the baths as a recreation area to relax away from the discipline of the fort. This bathhouse has been recreated at Zanten in Germany. We are in the bathhouse. Soldiers entered in this room, that's the changing room. They undressed and put their clothes in these boxes and went to the next room, to the bathroom. This is where they used to come first, to get clean. They put oil on their skin and with this scraper, 
they took the oil off, they washed themselves, and they went into the bath. So this is the warm water bath. It was kept at the 100 uh, degrees Fahrenheit by the furnace, which is next door. So people stayed in this warm water. After finishing, they went to the next bath, which is the cold bath. This is the cold bath. And Romans believe that it was good to take a cold bath to improve the blood circulation. So after finishing uh, their bath in the cold water, they went to the club room. So this is the club room where soldiers came after having their cold bath. They could stay for a while here. They could talk to each other, playing dice, having massage, and just forget being a soldier for a short while. Another prominent example of plumbing was the toilets, which were communal. Seats were only two feet apart and were open to the air, except for a small roof. Because toilet paper had not yet been invented, soldiers used a sponge on a stick, which they cleaned in the water channel that ran in front of the seats. For the soldiers' amusement, many forts had amphitheaters, like this one reconstructed at Zonten in Germany. They were used for special festivals, including religious sacrifices, and also modest versions of Roman games, including gladiator contests. Soldiers on the frontiers needed diversions because there were long periods of boring peace. I would have thought that most Roman soldiers serving on the wall here, doing their full 25 years, might never cast a spear in anger in the whole of that time. Soldiers spent much of their time doing paperwork. The forts generated tons of it. Some of it has miraculously survived at one Roman fort. Coming up, actual soldiers' letters from 2,000 years ago, giving a fascinating portrait of life on the frontier. At a Roman fort in the north of England, archaeologists are discovering a treasure trove of personal items left by the troops, giving us an amazingly intimate portrait of the Roman soldier's life. From deep in the mud at Vindolanda Fort have come hundreds of soldiers' letters. Here is an example of a, a document written on, in ink on specially prepared wood. It's either alder or birch, local wood that they've specially created these tablets for. We don't work from the, the originals at all. We work entirely from the infrared photographs because you, they show up so much more than you can see with the naked eye. Direct messages from the past. Um, there's a lovely one, and that is from an officer, our commanding officer, a draft letter going out from here saying, when I was with you, I left behind all my hunting nets. Please send them on to me, namely my special drag nets for swans, the small nets for thrushes, and you know, so it goes on. Um, this extraordinary letter coming in to a soldier saying, um, I am sending you a parcel of uh, some socks, two pairs of shoes, and then it said subligaria. Now, subligaria is a very rare word, and that had people thumbing through all the dictionaries. It does appear, I think, in a fairly rare poem of the poet Catullus. It's underpants. And much more than just letters have been found within Dolanda. There are all sorts of weapons and evidence of how the soldiers used them. Often we pick up uh, a thing like this, which is the skull of a Roman cattle, a cow or an oxen or something. It's been poleaxed. You can see the big indentation here. Someone has banged it like that. And then it's obviously been stuck on a pole and used for target practice. We have actually several of these. You can see where the, the Roman ballistas have gone boom, straight in. The deep soil and mud at Vindolanda is so well suited to preserving ancient artifacts that even Roman textiles have been found in good condition. That is what it looks like. It's a Roman bandage um, made of uh, some quite good quality local wool. But we get everything from bandages to bits of big jerseys, um, even a sock 
made out of two different pieces of textiles sewn together. But again, you know, it's wonderful getting the textiles. They've lost their colour, although by analysing them, we can actually work out what colour they originally had. And you'll see in our display case, their colours are much softer and gentler than the rather harsh colours produced by artificial dyes today. Being a Roman soldier fighting against barbarians may have seemed a risky business, but in fact, Roman soldiers were more likely to reach the age of 40 than the average Roman male citizen. Soldiers were well housed and well trained and had a better diet than many city dwellers. They were given daily rations of corn, wine, vinegar, and salt, plus vegetables, poultry, fish, and cheese whenever they were available. It's interesting that bad food, which is one of the constant complaints of soldiers through the ages, uh, is not mentioned uh, in any of our sources as a complaint of Roman soldiers. Another reason for higher life expectancy was the medical attention the army received. And it was so advanced that soldiers expected to live through their service and had, it's one of the few ages in history when men had a higher life expectancy than women because of the, the medical, the battlefield medic. For the army doctor, the most common job was to fix battle wounds. This is a, an arrow, a male piercing arrow. And if it's gone into the arm, it's got to come out, obviously. You can't just pull it out. The first thing you've got to do is use a scalpel to make an incision either side of the arrow to open it up. And retractors are brought in to peel back the skin and expose the arrow. Then you can start to draw it out. If you've got severe bleeding, you might need to clamp it. These clamps are virtually identical to ones that are used in modern operating theatres. Or these, which look like a tweezer but with a sliding ring, clamp tight shut. To stop the bleeding, a cautery. You heat this up over coals, insert it in, seals off the wound. Great. Finally, you want to close the wound over. Now, you could stitch it, and we got needles made of bronze and bone, but the items that they stitched it with, sinew or, or flax, was a contaminant. It, it festered in, in infection. So they came up with wound staples. This is made out of silver, which is hypoallergenic. Insert it into one side of the room, wound, pull it over and stick it in, and that holds it tight. And the little lines that are on it, the little decoration, they're weak points when it comes to taking it out. You snip those and it comes out easy. And they're using these in, at the end of the 20th century. They're finding that staples heal faster than stitches. So we're moving back to ideas that they had 2,000 years ago. Roman medics were also herbalists, prescribing rosemary as an antiseptic and caraway as a poultice for bruises. Another thing about caraway is um, the essential oil of it is a stimulant. And it's supposedly good for flatulence. And when you've got eight men sharing a small leather tent, that's uh, probably a good thing. Like most armies, the Romans believed that the gods were on their side. And so the soldiers were particularly careful not to offend those gods. Before a battle, animals would be sacrificed and omens would be studied. For example, the flight of birds or cloud formations to determine if the gods wanted a Roman victory. The average soldier prayed to as many gods as he could manage, the traditional gods such as Jupiter, Apollo, Mars, and Hercules, plus any local gods in the country where he was campaigning. They do seem to have had an adopt-a-god scheme um, wherever they went. They were always terribly worried that somebody else had more important gods than them and they were very concerned not to offend any deities. And the way that the Romans reacted to, to God is they, they don't seem to have been too concerned about what happened in the afterlife. Their concern was to make sure they were as comfortable as possible whilst they were on Earth. And the way you ensured that was to keep the gods happy. One of the most popular gods that the Roman soldiers adopted was Mithras from Persia, who was usually shown slaying the mystic bull, whose blood is the source of life. Many forts had temples to Mithras, like this one, reconstructed at Salzburg in Germany. It would have been very dark. Each Mithraeum was supposed to be as dark as the original cave where Mithras killed the boar. So it would have been dark and smoky and um, pine cones um, burning as incense on one of the altars. 
they all seem to have had this relief showing Mithras killing the primeval bull. Now this, according to Mithraic worshippers, was the act of creation. And from this act of killing the bull, all life sprang. And you can see that the wheat is growing from his tail there. One religion that was not very widespread in the army was Christianity. It did not become the official religion of the empire until the 300s AD, towards the end of the Western Empire. It would have been quite difficult, I think, to have been a Christian in the Roman army before it became the official religion, because the Roman army expected you to worship certain set deities, such as the birthday of the emperor or, or, the, or Jupiter, on certain days. And if you were a Christian and believed there was only one god, then you would have a fundamental problem with that. The soldiers carried other objects of worship with them at all times. One was the legionary eagle, often made of gold. It was housed in its own chapel and anointed with special oil on religious days. The soldiers marched behind it into battle, and it symbolized the spirit of the legion itself. To lose your standard to the enemy was a terrible disgrace, and uh, Roman soldiers literally gave their lives to save their flag and, and their symbols. There was also the cult of the emperor, and each legion carried his image. It was important for the troops to be able to recognize their emperor. He was with them in spirit, if not in person, though sometimes he would be there in person, as when the Emperor Hadrian toured the entire empire. Emperor worship was also an important part of Roman religious life. As well as worshipping their gods, the soldiers would worship their emperor. One way the emperors made sure the soldiers recognized them was by putting their faces on the coins the soldiers were paid with. Next, we'll look at the Roman soldier's pay, how he spent it, and how it helped to change the map of Europe. Roman soldiers had something that few other people in the ancient world ever had, regular pay. Legionaries were paid the equivalent of a middle-class salary plus annual bonuses from the emperors to try to ensure loyalty. To emphasize that point, the emperors put their own faces on the coins, like these found at Vindolanda Fort in northern England. There is a nice Cestertius of the Emperor Trajan. Fairly normal coin on a find on many sites. It's, it's all green and moldy. That is how Roman coins normally come out. But on a site like this, where we've got these rather special levels buried deep down, that is the same issue of coin coming from the early levels. I mean, you know, you'd think that was gold, but it's not. It's a nice shiny bronze coin in excellent condition, no corrosion, nothing. The soldiers' savings were kept in special strong rooms at the forts, like this rare surviving example at Chester's Fort on Hadrian's Wall. It was an ancient mini version of Fort Knox. This was probably one of the safest places for, for money to be anywhere in the Roman province of Britain because you've got 500 soldiers guarding it and they're guarding a lot of their own money because Roman soldiers had uh, about a third of their pay kept back as a compulsory savings scheme. As well as compulsory savings, soldiers had deductions taken from their pay for food, clothes, weapons and the burial club to pay for their tombstones. There were other deductions too. Fines for, for loss of equipment, um, buying that extra pepper to liven up the food, or indeed, uh, if they're not feeling very well, buying some opium. I mean, we get opium on the tablets, the quartermaster is issuing it. We would like to think for medical purposes, I mean, you never know. <laughs> because regular salaries were rare in ancient times, the Roman soldiers' pay was a magnet for local civilians wherever they went. Villages sprang up outside every fort. These are the remains of one such village outside Salzburg Fort in Germany. The town supplied the soldiers with food, alcohol, and entertainment, and there were always local women. Although soldiers were officially not allowed to marry until around 200 AD when that law was changed, many soldiers kept unofficial wives and children in the towns next to the forts. This was tolerated because soldiers' sons often became new recruits. Some of the towns outlived the forts themselves and became great cities. Examples include Cologne and Bonn in Germany and York in England. 
It was in the civilian towns that many soldiers chose to live once they retired, moving just a few yards from inside the fort to outside. Sometimes towns were created by Rome as official colonies. The Roman government, as an act of policy, planted large numbers of veteran soldiers in a new city uh, called a colony, Colonia. And uh, often these were actually converted military bases, so a military base directly becomes a city. Colonies were like little Romes planted throughout the empire, a way of securing and Romanizing conquered territory while giving veterans a place to live. One example was Fréjus, now a modern city on the French Riviera, which served a double purpose as a naval base and a colony founded by Augustus for veterans and civilians. It was the birthplace of the great Roman general Agricola, who helped conquer Britain. Fréjus was a colony for the 8th Legion, and evidence of that has been found in recent excavations. This uh, cheek piece of an uh, iron helmet of the early 1st century AD, it is a protection of the right cheek of a helmet. And it's a very unusual find, especially in France, because uh, on the Roman camps, uh, the soldiers were very careful with their weapons. They didn't lose them. Fréjus had all the trappings of a Roman town, including an amphitheater holding 12,000 spectators, which is still used today for bullfights. It also had an aqueduct, probably built by the soldiers. These pillars supported a water channel that gradually sloped down to Fréjus from a mountain source 25 miles away. Roman engineers calculated the precise slope needed for the aqueduct, and then soldiers were brought in to do the heavy work of building. To build the water channel, the Romans used a technique builders still use today. They built a wooden mold, then filled it with concrete. They just had to put some planks here inside the, the channel, and then they had the mold, internal mold for it, and then they could pour the concrete uh, between the two parts, just as we do now with the concrete, you know, the Romans used the, the concrete in the same way as we do. The building skills of the army helped to change the face of the empire. Soldiers built not only military structures, like forts and Hadrian's Wall, but also had a hand in some of the many beautiful and enduring civilian works right across Europe and the Middle East that helped put Rome's particular stamp on its hard-won territory. For the Romans, however, spreading their civilization carried unexpected dangers. It made the empire an inviting target for those living outside the borders and would lead to invasion by envious barbarians that would eventually bring the empire to its knees.